appearing in an Instagram live chat with soccer star Megan Rapino on April 30th, presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden made a spontaneous, vague statement about how he's been speaking to a lot of Republicans, including former colleagues, who are calling and saying, Joe, if you win, we're gonna help. Then he showed his hand, matter of fact, there's some major Republicans who are already forming, Republicans for Biden, the former vice president said. Major office holders. The comment hardly received any attention at the time. But in declaring it, Biden ended up tipping off the earliest stages of a brewing effort that's starting to get underway in certain Republican circles behind the scenes. Interviews with several of the most prominent never-Trump Republicans reveal that for now, the nascent effort is loosely defined and could ultimately take a variety of forms. But preliminary talks about messaging, engagement, leadership, and rollout are starting to be broadly sketched out, according to sources directly familiar with the matter. And the talks have happened more frequently as Biden moves solidly into general election mode. It is literally just forming, one former top Republican Party official involved with the preliminary discussions told the Daily Beast. I've had several conversations with people who have approached me. It's going to take off, it's going to happen. The question is to what degree and form it does, the source, who was granted anonymity to speak candidly about private discussions, said. You don't want something like this out on the street before it needs to be, the GOP source added. It just makes it much harder to do. The contours of a developing Republicans for Biden movement are indeed fluid, with longtime operatives and former party loyalists mixed on what a final product would look like and when it might come into fruition. The movement behind the scenes is in contrast to the very public effort to unite the left, but matches Biden's own professed fondness for working with Republicans. When presented with Biden's comments, GOP sources interviewed referenced two main possibilities, an external group that would work on his behalf as a political action committee, similar to other Democratic-led outside groups, that could theoretically clear a pathway for others to join, or an internal operation within Biden's campaign, with one or more recognizable Republican figures joining as the public face. A second source well-placed in Republican circles, who has had conversations with senior Biden advisors in recent weeks, said that any mounting effort would most likely come from within the campaign's vast network. My impression is the official one will be part of the campaign, the Republican source said, referencing the apparent Republicans for Biden, group Biden mentioned himself. Among the GOP's more ardent anti-Trump faction, several names came up in conversation when asked who could theoretically have a role in an outside political entity, which would not be allowed under campaign finance laws to coordinate with the campaign directly. Those names include former Senator Jeff Flake, R.S., Wisconsin-based political analyst Charlie Sykes, conservative media giant Bill Kristol, former Republican National Committee Chairman Michael Steele, longtime campaign operative Steve Schmidt, former Representative David Jolly, R.F.L., and columnist Mona Charon, among others. Meanwhile, one name in particular has been floated as a choice to help give legs to such an effort from the inside, former Republican Ohio Governor John Kasich. The source who has spoken to top Biden allies about a number of topics said there has been discussion in Biden world about Kasich, a leading never-Trump voice, who joined as a CNN analyst after leaving office in January 2019. A senior Kasich strategist denied any discussions. It's done, but the reason it's not common is there are few people willing to do that, longtime Democratic campaign strategist Joe Trippi said about the possibility of a Republican joining a Democrat's campaign in this capacity, or vice versa. It's not rare on the Biden campaign's part. You just don't usually have that many prominent people usually willing to cross lines in the middle of a presidential campaign. But when presented with both options, Trippi said the campaign would most likely want outside and internal GOP help if available. If you're the Biden campaign, you want both those things to happen, he said. I don't think it's either or. Reached for comment, a spokesperson for the Biden campaign said, in part, Vice President Biden is running for president to unite our country and rebuild the soul of the nation, and to accomplish that we need to bring together Americans from across the political spectrum to build the broadest possible coalition to defeat Donald Trump.
as we move into the general election, we're going to continue to ramp up our outreach to Americans of all political stripes including the many disaffected Republicans who are horrified by Trump's historic mismanagement of the coronavirus crisis. The campaign declined to elaborate on Biden's own prior statement about a Republicans for Biden group forming. Since securing near-instant party unity following his sweeping victory in South Carolina, Biden's campaign has been focused on weaving the values of progressive leaders into their emerging platform. After Senator Bernie Sanders, IVT, his final primary opponent and longtime Senate friend, departed from the race and endorsed him last month, the former rivals announced the formation of several task forces as a way to prioritize progressive issues. My impression, more than an impression, is they have been cautious about going ahead with anything official, Republicans for Biden, partly because, they want to make sure the Democrats are all okay first, said the source who has been in talks with Biden advisors. Still, Biden has already been sending less than subtle signals to Republicans on his own. Throughout much of the primary, the former VP remained the national frontrunner with the explicit message that he can appeal to a broad coalition of individuals needed to beat Trump, often maintaining more moderate policy positions when his opponents tilted leftward. At one juncture in late 2019, he even floated the possibility of selecting a Republican running mate, an idea he has since backed away from since becoming the party's presumptive nominee. As his campaign continues to plow forward towards November, Biden has taken new steps to appeal to Republicans. In late April, he said during a virtual fundraiser that he would consider naming Republicans to his cabinet under the stipulation that they were the best qualified person. To some Republicans, that type of public messaging from Biden, paired with early private discussions, is setting the right groundwork for one or more efforts to take off in earnest on his behalf, albeit at a slower pace in the age of COVID-19. I know that it's happening and it's coming together, Jennifer Horn, a longtime Republican operative and former state party official, told The Daily Beast. Horn said she was approached several months ago by a national GOP operative about specifically joining a Republicans for Biden effort, but hasn't been involved directly. Instead, she's focused her attention on the Lincoln Project, an anti-Trump super PAC she advises along with George Conway, the husband of White House advisor Kellyanne Conway, Schmidt, and political operatives John Weaver and Rick Wilson, a Daily Beast columnist. With less than six months until Election Day, there are already a number of Republicans and ex-Republicans who have stated they intend to vote for Biden. On Tuesday, former CEO of Hewlett-Packard Carly Fiorina, who competed against Trump in 2016, declared that she cannot vote for Donald Trump in 2020, while entertaining the possibility of not voting. For Republicans aiming to get a pro-Biden movement off the ground, that potential scenario, where voters may feel they simply can't vote for Trump or Biden, is a nightmarish thought. It's really hard to get people to take that last step, Horn said. To publicly say and do something. You need five or ten people who are all ready to go at the same time. There's also a mounting concern in at least some corners, according to the GOP source who has been in conversations with other Republicans about the possible difficulties, that Biden's campaign might not be able to join forces in a seamless way, noting technical and operational difficulties they have had recently. A coalition like this has to be knitted together very carefully because it can very quickly fall apart and everyone is made to look stupid, the source said. That's the last thing that anyone who gets out on this bandwagon wants to do when they realize that the wheels aren't on securely. While most Republicans interviewed spoke candidly about the first portion of Biden's statement, when asked about the second part, that major officeholders are starting this effort, no GOP source contacted could present a concrete name. Indeed, most admitted they would be shocked to hear of anyone at the Senate or House level likely to take such a step, but did not rule out the possibility that Biden could be referring to state or local elected officials. Others are less convinced. Former Representative Joe Walsh, R. Ill, who plans to vote for the Democrat in an expected Trump versus Biden matchup, said, it's still a leap for a Republican to publicly say they're against Trump. It still takes some balls, and so I don't think you'll see a huge number of well-known names, he said. I don't think there's any freaking way a current elected Republican would ever sign their name onto Republicans for Biden, Walsh said. 
they've demonstrated over the course of the last three years that they're just too damn cowardly to do that. That sense of skepticism was picked up in other conversations. No one wants to end up like Jeff Flake. Fergus Cullen, a Trump critic and past chairman of the New Hampshire Republican Party said about the former Arizona senator, who retired from the Senate with an isolated anti-Trump crusade early last year. The sense of resignation shared among some disgruntled Republicans is built, at least partially, on recent history. Early in the presidential cycle, so-called never-Trump Republicans were not able to woo a single marquee challenger into primarying the president, with Kasich and others passing on the opportunity. Former South Carolina Governor Mark Sanford ran in the GOP primary for a short time before abandoning his run in November, leaving Walsh and former Massachusetts Governor Bill Weld as the most prominent remaining options. Both failed to gain much traction or sway any prominent current GOP office holders to their cause. This is about killing the alligator closest to the boat, said Rick Tyler, who served as Senator Ted Cruz's RTX communications director during his 2016 presidential campaign. People say how can you support Biden? The alligator that's going to kill us is the closest one, and that's Trump, he said. I don't want Biden to be president. I don't want Trump to be president, he added. Am I willing to have Biden be president so Trump won't be president? You're damn right I am. Morningside USA was supposed to be apocalypse proof. A gated, stucco fortress in the southwest corner of Missouri's Ozark Mountains, Morningside is an evangelical Christian community built to rent condos right through the end of the world. Where are you going to go when the world's on fire? Where are you going to go? This place is for God's people and this place, we need some farmers to move here, Morningside's founder, the disgraced doomsday televangelist, Jim Bakker, said in a May 2018 sermon. Did you know people from the government, from NASA, research from so many of them, they have said in their research, the safest place to live in troubled times is right here? Morningside is the name of Bakker's Christian broadcasting empire, as well as the Missouri residential community from which he broadcasts. But it's mostly made news in recent weeks because of its founders' legal woes. Various government agencies have accused Bakker of promoting a fake COVID-19 miracle cure. So what does the coronavirus pandemic look like in this temple of survival? According to interviews with people who have recently lived, worked, and spent time there, pretty much the same waking nightmare as everywhere else, mixed efforts at social distancing, layoffs, and reported shortages of everyday supplies as COVID-19 ravages the country. A former Morningside employee who spoke on the condition of anonymity because she hoped to return to her job as the pandemic eased said she was among a wave of layoffs as the community entered lockdown in late March. They were running out of supplies they had stocked up on when I was leaving there, said the former employee, who argued Bakker was being vilified in the media. Neither Morningside nor a Bakker representative returned requests for comment for this story. The story of Morningside's development involves two failed historical theme parks and two dozen criminal charges. Bakker, now 80, was a star of the 1980s televangelist scene and even expanded into a biblical theme park until feds convicted him of an elaborate scheme to illegally skim millions off the amusement park. A former church secretary also accused him of sexually assaulting her and buying her silence, although he claimed to have only had consensual extramarital sex with her, and was never charged. 24 convictions on fraud and conspiracy charges in the amusement park scandal and four years in prison later, Bakker was released from lockup in 1994. By 2003, he'd returned to broadcast ministry, this time with an eye on the end times. He preached the apocalypse and used a loophole in nonprofit law to hawk survivalist gear like supposed health supplements and giant buckets of shelf-stable food. Imagine, one of Bakker's emergency food ads said, the world is dying and you're having a breakfast for kings. Because his ministry is technically a non-profit, Bakker does not sell his goods, he offers them as love gifts to people who make specific donations, like $4,500 for a peace of mind final countdown, bundle that contained 31,000 servings of food in a variety of buckets. In 2008, he opened Morningside, a church complex, Christian broadcast studio, Evangelical Utopia on the former site of a followers' renaissance fair-themed amusement park. 
It was the ultimate survivalist sales pitch. Bakker claimed it could withstand an imminent apocalypse, and offered a variety of dwellings on site. Higher-end homes included condos overlooking a shopping mall like Central Meeting Area, which also featured a chapel, a general store, a cafe, and a 15-foot statue of Jesus. Would-be survivalists could also live in something called a dome home, a hemispherical concrete structure that Morningside advertises thus, in 2003, a monolithic dome government building in Iraq survived a direct hit by a 5,000-pound bomb. But for all its disaster preparedness talk, Morningside appears to have faced many of the same coronavirus inconveniences as the outside world. Susie Ruiz, a longtime Morningside resident who recently sold her condo there, said the restaurant had converted to takeout only during the pandemic and that the general store, which sells canned foods and religious tchotchkes, had placed markers on the floor six feet apart to encourage social distancing. Pam Burnett, administrator of Stone County Health Department, which oversees Morningside USA, said the county only had three confirmed cases of the novel coronavirus. Residents in the rural county might have an easier time maintaining a healthy distance than those in larger cities, she said. And while she declined to comment on Morningside, she noted residents in close quarters can protect themselves by washing their hands, wearing face masks, and keeping apart when possible. Of course, social distancing can come as a blow to a close-knit community like Morningside. I was just down there a couple days ago and they have prayer teams, Ruiz said. It's always been a place where people volunteered. There's a sense of community, not like a compound, not like a cult, but just like any senior place, where you have all these people congregate. There's movie night on Saturday. They've got game night. They've got exercise classes, stuff like that. There's just a pulling together, a sense of community. One of the biggest threats to traditions like game night is not the coronavirus but Bakker's own legal and financial worries. The televangelist made headlines in March when the Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, and state officials in New York and Missouri slapped him for allegedly promoting a bogus coronavirus cure on his TV show. The so-called Silver Solution was touted as a salve for COVID-19, SARS, HIV, and other ailments. Bakker denied the allegations in a filing on Monday. He is being represented by former Missouri Governor Jay Nixon, and is also facing a class action lawsuit by a Missouri resident for his alleged promotion of the Silver Solution. His lawyers declined to comment on the lawsuit earlier this week. As a result of his legal woes, Bakker claimed to have been cut off from credit card processing companies. In mid-April, he began begging followers to send physical checks, suggesting his legal fight was so expensive that he'd have to sell parts of Morningside unless his followers sent more money. I'm just sad to see what's happening to America, Bakker said in an April broadcast, according to Right Wing Watch. We are living in the final days, and if we go the wrong direction, America is through. You have to use a check for donations and purchases. Your products are going to come to you. Every one of them will come right to your house, and if we can't, we are going to refund. I will sell parts of the buildings at Morningside in the long run if you give me a chance. Don't let me have to file for bankruptcy. Morningside appeared to be saving some money the way many American businesses are cutting its staff. The recently laid-off employee said she was among many workers to lose their jobs when Morningside started practicing social distancing measures, like having its televangelist hosts film programs from home. They had to let go of pretty much everyone except essential workers who were helping with production of the show who were essential like video editors or camera guys, or guys who worked in shipping, she said. During at least one previous disaster, Ruiz said, the general store sustained Morningside through food precarity. Although Bakker now sells portable generators for $1,090, Morningside initially lacked a backup generator shortly after she moved there in 2008, she recalled. That winter, we had an ice storm, she said. Everything was shut down, but it was one of the coolest times because we all hunkered down in the main part of the building. Pastor Jim was a super generous guy. He opened up the general store and oh my goodness, we were eating like we were on death row. We were having ice cream and whatever. It was really cool. Eventually they got a generator that turned the lights on just for the inside of the building and then they got a bigger generator for the whole building. 
Those were Morningside's early, sparsely populated days. A 2018 article said the population had since expanded to more than 70 full-time residents, with plans to grow above 2,000. The former employee wasn't sure whether Morningside had been able to restock on essential goods since she left. Lori's House, a Morningside home for expectant mothers, recently put out a call for baby products. And for all its associations with disaster food buckets, Morningside doesn't hold the main stockpile, the former employee noted. The buckets are not assembled in Morningside, but purchased from the Utah-based Augustin Farms Bulk Food Company, which often ships them directly to Bakker's customers. The general store did have some of the food buckets they sell still there, but it's mostly shipped out from places that aren't at Morningside, the former worker said. If you order online, it comes from Augustin Farms. It doesn't go to Morningside. As for the allegations that Bakker fraudulently peddled a silver solution miracle cure, the former employee claimed Bakker uses the products himself. Pastor Jim's always been a believer in being prepared, she said. He wouldn't endorse something he didn't believe in and use himself. Everything he sells, I've seen him use. I've seen him use silver on a daily basis. Ruiz, who attended a different church than Bakker's despite living at Morningside, said not to conflate the locals with the man who made the community famous. While she was living there, people told her Morningside can come off like a compound, she said. Give me a break, Ruiz added. It's a place where people live, and then there's Jim Bakker.